Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware. We have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit. But frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen, and this is episode number 80, which is really fun because it rhymes with Katie, who is, in fact, my co-host. <laughs> wow. Hey, they can't all be winners. Obviously. Let's just keep rolling into the rolling rehash. Last week, we covered chapter 15, Bobaton and Durmstrang, and we revisited the film scene that actually corresponded, but was shoehorned into an earlier section of the movie. Harry did some impressively pathetic backtracking to convince Sirius not to come back, unless you were watching the movie, in which case, he totally didn't. Reverse psychology was needed to convince Hedwig to acquiesce when needed. Moody spit out unforgivable curses like a rapper with unforgettable verses. Trelawney just couldn't take a hint. Snape used the line of ethics as a jump rope while trying to motivate his students. And Hogwarts' new house guests seem to be somewhat less impressed with their host school than it is with them. During episode 79, BAM House Guests, our Potter pondering was, what are your thoughts on how the movie included the arrival of Bobatons and Durmstrang during the start of term feast, rather than in October as the book has it? Kylie can kind of see why they did it. If they stuck to the book, you'd be in the Great Hall for a somewhat opening feast, then like five minutes for Moody's class, then back to the Great Hall. Huh? Quincy said, that dumbass shit. I get the fact it's streamlining, but I mean, come on. One, why are they gender-specific schools? Two, the entrances didn't really give us any knowledge on what the schools were about. And furthermore, why is Fleur's little sister there? Plot convenience, I suspect, but it's so painfully obvious that they're literally just doing shit just to do shit. Not even trying to make it make sense. Fuck out of here with that. Goblet of Fire is my favorite book, but the movie can suck a sick dick. <laughs> Not just a regular dick. A sick one. A sick dick. Sick dick. All oh, rhymes. <laughs> Katie and 80. <laughs> Moving on. Diana said there was no build-up or antissa. Say it! Patient. <laughs> Patience. <laughs> Which was disappointing. She gets the streamlining bit, but she doesn't think it would have really added all that much time to the movie if they'd done it as it was written. The gender divide was also super stupid, and it did nothing for the plot except add questions. Is Hogwarts the only European co-ed school for young witches and wizards? If so, why aren't there more French boys at Durmstrang or Hogwarts, and more Bulgarian girls at Bobatons or Hogwarts? It's pointless. Juliana thinks it definitely streamlines the timeline, but it makes more sense to her to separate the two events. What bugs her more is the sexist division of Bobatons and Durmstrang. Which seems to be a theme. Mm-hmm. And they're not wrong. They're not wrong. Max says he's not going to lie. His annoyance at this stems entirely from hating when people arrive during dinner. Either arrive on time or don't arrive. Apart from that, it actually makes way more sense to him that they would arrive at the start of the school year rather than a couple weeks in. What's the point of traveling to one school and waiting like half a month and then packing off to a whole other country? They had French exchange students at his school, and they arrived in the summer holiday before term started because that actually makes fucking sense. They weren't staying in a carriage or on a boat either. He's honestly not sure why they didn't take the opportunity to send two groups of under-17 students to both of the other schools for the sake of culture experiences, and then have the beds that they would need spare. That's actually a good point. I kind of right. like that. However, it was like two months. Yeah. Because they arrived September 1st and they showed up October 30th, so. True. Very true. Just saying. I don't know. I kind of see the point. But Carly really wishes that they had included it the way it was in the book. She feels like the timeline of the movie is so rushed. We also never get any classic Hogwarts downtime in the movies. So it would have been nice to see a few of the chapters before they got there. 
She really wishes they had split this movie into two. It would have been so good to be able to see it all. Dave said that from a movie perspective, it makes sense. Did anything happen in the first month worth noting that propels the plot forward that didn't happen the way the movie set it up? He wonders if the movie folks thought teenage boys fawning over pretty girls, or girls and Ron, being awestruck over Crumb, would be more relatable to viewers than grasping the concept of Vila's in their spell. If they had to deal with Vila-induced boys every scene, they could never move the plot forward. Which I can see where Dave's coming from, but since the Vila have the power to turn that spell on and off, it's not like they had to include it every time. Yeah. But it's fun when they include more magical aspects of the wizarding worlds or just the magic community in general. Yeah, I agree. It would have been nice to see. It's all we're getting at. Yeah. Nice to friggin' see. Lislotta doesn't necessarily mind the combination with the opening feast, since it does not matter in the end whether they're already there and it saves the movie some time. She does very much agree with Quincy that the gender divide is very strange and unnecessary. Are there only witches and Bobatons and wizards and Durmstrang? Or did the teacher become sexist and only bring one gender? Either way, super strange. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Kendra said she's honestly never had a strong opinion on this. Obviously, it's silly to have the students of the two schools just hanging around until the tournament, but for the sake of the movie, it makes sense. Maybe they gave him an empty classroom to study in for those couple of months. Robert thinks it seems weird because instead of being at their own school and learning and getting more practice on their own terms, they have to be stuck at a foreign school with people they don't know, and on the chance the other students don't get chosen, they're just shit out of luck and remain at Hogwarts. Yeah. We had so many great responses this week. Mm Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for participating. Yeah, thank you so much. Our trivia question last week was... What dessert does Ron shift to the side to try and entice the Vila girl to come back over to the Gryffindor table? Ron examines an odd sort of pale black mange, and then moves it a few inches to his right in the hopes that the pretty girl will come back over and ask for it, as she did with the bouillabaisse. In an unexpected twist, congratulations goes to Carly Ferguson. Woohoo! After searching through the episode multiple times, she finally found the trivia question and posted the answer for the win. And after some gloating in our patron chat group that she ended Mike's streak, Mike claimed to have completely forgotten. How very convenient. He was so close to tying the record. Mm Mm-hmm. It's the second time he's lost it in the final week. I think he's caving to the pressure. Honestly, it just seems like you don't want it enough, Mike. That's all we're saying. That's all we're getting at. It'll be interesting to see who gets it this week. Will Carly be starting up a streak? Will Mike be rebuilding his? Will Max jump back in? Will we ever see Quincy try to defend his record again? Will Dave get better internet? Who knows? For now, let's just keep rolling into the first half of Chapter 16, The Goblet of Fire, and the corresponding film scenes. Chapter 16, The Goblet of Fire, Part 1 Ron is completely stunned to realize that Victor Crumb, one of the best seekers in the world, is still at school. They cross the entrance hall again and can see Lee Jordan jumping up and down to get a better look at Crumb and several sixth-year girls searching for something they can use to ask him to sign something for them. Hermione is not amused as one of the girls wonders if he will sign her hat in lipstick, but Ron really wants to try to get Crumb's autograph too. They walk over to the Gryffindor table and sit down, with Ron facing the Durmstrang students still gathered by the door, wondering where to sit. The Bobaton students are already sitting at the Ravenclaw table and are glumly looking around the Great Hall, some still clutching scarves and shawls around their head. Hermione doesn't think it's that cold, but Ron isn't paying attention to what she's saying because he's too busy trying to make space so Durmstrang, specifically Victor Crumb, will sit at the Gryffindor table with them. Instead, Crumb and his classmates sit at the Slytherin table. Ron wonders where they're going to sleep and is willing to sleep on a camp bed to let Crumb have his. Hermione snorts and Harry points out that they look happier than the Bobaton's lot as the Durmstrang students remove their furs and look around the Great Hall, apparently impressed. 
They see Filch adding four extra chairs to the staff table, and Harry wonders who else is joining them, since they only have two extra people at this time. Once all of the students are settled, the staff enters to take their seats. The pupils from Bobaton stand as their headmistress appears, and only resume their seats once she is seated. Dumbledore remains standing and welcomes everyone, saying he hopes and trusts their stay will be comfortable and enjoyable. One girl from Bobatons gives a derisive laugh, making Hermione bristle defensively and whisper that no one is making her stay. Dumbledore finishes his speech, saying the tournament will officially open at the end of the feast and invites them to eat, drink, and make themselves at home. He sits and Karkaroth immediately engages him in conversation. The food magically appears in front of them as usual, but this time they include a wider variety of dishes, many of which are foreign. Ron points to some sort of shellfish stew and asks what it is, and Hermione explains that it's a very nice French dish called bouillabaisse. But Ron sarcastically says, bless you, and that he'll take her word for it. About 20 minutes later, Hagrid enters the Great Hall, slides into his seat, and waves at the trio with a heavily bandaged hand. Harry calls out to ask him how the scroots are, and Hagrid responds that they are thriving. Ron quietly comments that it looks like they finally found a food they like, Hagrid's fingers. He's interrupted by the girl from Bobatons, who had laughed at Dumbledore's speech, asking if he is wanting the bouillabaisse. Ron looks up at the girl and goes purple as he sees she has large, deep blue eyes, very white, even teeth, and waist-length, silvery blonde hair. He can't even manage to make a sound, so Harry pushes it towards her and says she can have it. Ron manages to say it was excellent and goggles her as she picks it up and heads back to the Ravenclaw table. Ron is returned to his senses when Harry laughs at him, and he hoarsely exclaims that she's a Vila. Hermione doesn't agree, saying no one else is gaping at her like an idiot, but she isn't entirely right. Many other boys become temporarily speechless as they watch her walk across the hall. Ron insists that she's not a normal girl, saying that they don't make them like that at Hogwarts. Without thinking, Harry says they make them okay at Hogwarts, as he notices Cho sitting a few seats away from the silvery-haired girl. Hermione tells them to see who just arrived, and points up at Ludo Bagman and Mr. Crouch sitting in the two remaining empty seats at the staff table. Harry wonders what they are doing there, and Hermione figures that it's to see the start of the Triwizard Tournament that they organized. The second course of food arrives and they notice a number of unfamiliar desserts as well. Ron moves a blanc manche in full sight of the blonde girl, but she doesn't come over to get it. After everyone is finished eating, Dumbledore again stands to announce the start of the tournament and to say a few words of explanation to clarify the procedure. He introduces Bartimius Crouch, who gets some polite applause, and Ludo Bagman, who gets a much louder round of applause. Bagman smiles and waves, though Crouch does not, and Harry thinks he looks odd in wizard robes, after last seeing him in an impeccable suit at the Quidditch World Cup. Dumbledore continues speaking about how tirelessly the two men have been working the last few months and says that they will be joining him, Madame Maxime, and Professor Karkaroff on the panel of judges. Dumbledore asks Filch to bring forward the casket and Filch approaches carrying a large wooden chest encrusted with jewels. Dumbledore explains that Mr. Crouch and Mr. Bagman have already gone over the instructions and made the necessary arrangements for the champions. There will be three tasks spaced throughout the school year designed to test the champion's magical prowess, daring, powers of deduction, and ability to cope with danger. The hall becomes completely silent for a moment before Dumbledore continues on, saying that there will be one champion chosen from each school. They will be marked on how well they perform and the champion with the highest total after the third task will win the Tri-Wizard Cup. The champions will be chosen by an impartial selector, the Goblet of Fire. He takes out his wand and taps the casket three times. The lid slowly creaks open and Dumbledore reaches in to pull out a large wooden and aside from the blue dancing flames, a fairly unremarkable cup. He closes the casket, places the cup on top of it where everyone in the hall can see it, and lets everyone know that anyone wishing to enter must write their name and school clearly on a piece of parchment and drop it into the goblet. They have 24 hours to enter their names, and the three champions will be chosen next night at the Halloween feast. He also reminds them of the age limit, and tells them that he will be drawing an age line around the Goblet of Fire once it has been placed in the entrance hall to ensure nobody under 17 can cross the line to enter. 
Lastly, he impresses upon them that the tournament is not to be entered lightly, as it creates a binding magical contract and there can be no change of heart. He then sends them all off to bed and wishes them a good night. As they make their way out of the great hall, they talk about what they just learned. Fred is sure that an age line will be fooled by an aging potion, though Hermione doesn't think anyone under 17 would stand a chance. George tells her to speak for herself and asks Harry if he's going to try. Harry again imagines winning the Triwizard Tournament, but then wonders how angry it would make Dumbledore if someone under 17 did get across the line. Ron is looking for Victor Crumb, wondering where he will be sleeping, and is completely oblivious to everything being discussed. Just as they are walking past the Slytherin table, Karkaroff shows up to take his students back to the ship. He asks Victor how he feels and if he ate enough, offering to send for some mulled wine from the kitchens. Crumb shakes his head, but another Durmstrang boy hopefully asks for some wine. Karkaroff snaps at the boy, Polyakov, and notices that he dribbled food all down his front again and calls him a disgusting boy. He turns to lead his students out of the Great Hall and reaches the door at the exact same moment as Harry, Ron, and Hermione. Harry stops to let him through first, and Karkaroff gives a careless glance as he thanks him. He freezes as he stares at Harry, his eyes fixing on the lightning bolt scar. Some of his students are also staring at Harry, and the boy with the food down his front nudges a girl and points at Harry's forehead. A growling voice from behind them confirms that he is Harry Potter, and Professor Karkaroff spins around to see Mad-Eye Moody glaring at him. The color drains from his face, and he looks both angry and afraid to see Moody there. Moody tells him that unless he has something to say to Potter, he might want to move since he's blocking the doorway. He watches with a look of intense dislike on his face until Karkaroff takes his students out of the Great Hall and out of sight. Even though it's Saturday and most students would sleep in, Harry, Ron, and Hermione are not the only ones who arise much earlier than usual. Down in the entrance hall, there are about 20 students milling around the Goblet of Fire on the stool that normally held the Sorting Hat. There's a thin golden line drawn around it, forming a 10-foot in diameter circle. Ron asks the third year if anyone has put their name in yet, and she responds that everyone from Durmstrang has, but she hasn't seen anyone from Hogwarts yet. Harry thinks that some of them had after everyone had gone to bed because that's how he would have done it. He wouldn't have wanted everyone watching. They hear a laugh behind them and see Fred, George, and Lee Jordan hurrying down the staircase, looking extremely excited. Fred tells them that they just took the aging potion, and Lee says that they are going to split the thousand galleons between them if one of them wins. Hermione tries to warn them that she isn't sure it will work because Dumbledore would have thought of this, but they just ignore her. Fred decides he will go first and pulls a slip saying his name and Hogwarts out of his pocket. With everyone watching him, he steps over the line, and for a split second it seems like it worked. George gives out a yell of triumph and crosses the line as well. But then there's a loud popping sound and the twins are hurled out of the circle. They land about 10 feet away on the stone floor and sprout identical long white beards. Everyone starts laughing, including Fred and George, and an amused voice tells them that he did warn them. They turn to see Dumbledore exiting the Great Hall, blue eyes twinkling. He tells them to go see Madame Pomfrey, who will sort out their fine beards, and they set off, accompanied by Lee Jordan, who is howling with laughter. Still chortling, Harry, Ron, and Hermione head into the Great Hall for breakfast and join Dean and Seamus, who are talking about the Hogwarts students that might be entering. Dean says there's a rumor that the big bloke from Slytherin who looks like a sloth, Warrington, got up early and put his name in. Harry shakes his head in disgust, saying they can't have a Slytherin champion. The movie section starts out with students entering their names into the Goblet of Fire as other students watch and clap. A couple of Hufflepuffs steer Cedric Diggory forward, encouraging him to put his name in the goblet. He briefly looks back at them and hesitates, then turns towards the blue flames and reaches out with a slip of parchment and drops it in. Ron looks over at Harry as they watch and everyone claps. As Cedric smiles and turns away from the goblet, Ron tries to wave at him, but is ignored and awkwardly lowers his hand. Cedric hugs his friends and Ron mentions one day entering the tournament themselves, when they are old enough. Harry says he'd rather it be Ron than him, and Fred and George enter the Great Hall, cheering about the aging potion they just cooked up that morning. Hermione warns them that it's not going to work, and the twins question her assessment. 
She explains to them that the circle around the goblet is an age line that Dumbledore drew himself, and that a genius like Dumbledore couldn't possibly be fooled by something as dim-witted as an aging potion. The twins insist that the fact that it is dim-witted is why it is so brilliant. They stand up, shake the vials holding the potion, and link arms as they say bottoms up and drink. Once they swallow, they jump into the circle and everyone starts cheering as it seems their potion has worked. They dance around in celebration a bit, then step up to the goblet and toss their names in at the same time. They high-five and the blue flames shoot out from the goblet at random angles and expel them from the circle. Everyone steps back, startled, as the twins hit the floor. They sit up and see that they are sprouting identical white hair and beards as everyone laughs in the background. Fred and George begin wrestling with each other while everyone continues laughing and encourages them. They are interrupted by the arrival of Victor Crumb, who stalks forward and drops his name into the goblet. He pauses for a moment to look intensely at Hermione, who looks back at him and slightly smiles. There are definitely parts of the movie section that directly correspond to the book chapter, but things have definitely been modified and streamlined. The book chapter picks up during the feast, right after Bobatons and Durmstrang arrive. The movie obviously can't start at this point because, as we talked about last week, they arrived way earlier in the movie than they did in the book. So that scene does not fit in at this point, and the movie does not start out corresponding until eh, a little bit further into the chapter. Yeah, Ron is stunned when he realizes that Victor Crumb, one of the best seekers in the world, is still at school. And that's totally believable. Mm -hmm. They cross the entrance hall, heading for the Great Hall, and see Lee Jordan jumping up and down to get a better look at Crumb. <laughs> I wish we could have seen that. I know! <laughs> Several sixth-year girls are frantically searching for something he could use to sign autographs for them. We saw a hint of this earlier on in the movie, but it was really just Ron reacting to Victor Crumb's entrance after all the stick-banging and man gymnastics. <laughs> Hermione is unamused, hearing one of the girls wonder if he would sign her hat in lipstick. I feel like that would just be messy. That's just not a good idea all around. It's just not. But Ron wants an autograph for himself and asks Harry if he can borrow a quill, which they're all upstairs. So Harry's just like, maybe you can borrow the girl's lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> they sit down at the Gryffindor table, Ron facing the Durmstrang students gathered by the door, still wondering where they're going to sit. Again, we say this previously, but there was no hesitation about sitting at tables. They sort of stood in front of the Great Hall at first, and the movie never showed us when they sat down and where. Well, the book gives those details. And the movie doesn't. <laughs> the Bobaton students had already sat down at the Ravenclaw table and were glumly looking around the Great Hall, a few still clutching scarves and shawls around their head. Hermione remarks that it isn't that cold, but Ron is too busy trying to make space for Victor Crumb to pay attention. Oh, Victor, you're so cute. Sorry. <laughs> it was too late, however. Crumb and his classmates made straight for the Slytherin table, where Malfoy immediately leaned forward to talk to the famous Quidditch player. Scathing at this scene, Ron wonders aloud where the Durmstrang students will sleep, making it clear that he would happily give his bed to Victor. Or share his bed. Victor, I love you. <laughs> Hermione snorts, and Harry points out how much happier they look than the Bobaton students, as the Durmstrang students remove their furs and look around, impressed by the great hall and the enchanted ceiling. At the staff table, Filch is adding chairs. Harry counts four and asks who the extra two chairs are for. Ron cannot reply, however, he's still staring avidly at Victor Crumb. Victor, I do. <laughs> <laughs> when we're apart, my, my heart beats only, only for you. you. <laughs> Once all the students are settled, the staff enter and take their seats. As Madame Maxime appears, the pupils from Bobatons leap to their feet, only sitting down themselves once she is seated. That's just polite. It is very polite, mm -hmm. even though the other Hogwarts students kind of laugh at them. Well. And they can't really do that in Hogwarts because Dumbledore remains standing to welcome everybody. So they can, yeah. are they going to make him stand throughout the whole feast? They'd legit be standing them. forever. Right. <laughs> He remains standing, welcomes everyone, wishes them a comfortable and enjoyable stay. And one girl from Boatons gives a derisive laugh, which makes Hermione get all snotty and just be like, no one's making you stay. <laughs> but no one's making her stay. I mean, that's true. 
She's, she's not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but still. Dumbledore finishes his speech saying the tournament will officially open at the end of the feast, inviting them to eat, drink, and make themselves at home. I feel like I keep saying this, but again, the movie sort of has this speech just shoehorned into the start of term feast. Yeah, they really just merge the two together and I don't like it. Mm -mm. But after he welcomes them, Dumbledore sits and Karkaroff immediately engages him in conversation. As always, the food magically appears in front of them, filling up the dishes on the table. This time was slightly different, though, because the meals that Hogwarts was accustomed to included several foreign dishes besides them. Hmm. Foreign dishes, huh? Who could those be foreign? <laughs> <laughs> Ron points out some sort of shellfish stew, and Hermione explains that it's a very nice French dish called bouillabaisse. Ron sarcastically blesses her sneeze and says he'll take her word for it, opting to eat a blood pudding instead. Oh, yeah, that's a no for me on both options. <laughs> Whoa. No, thank you. An allergy and an eulergy. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> About 20 minutes later, Hagrid enters the Great Hall, slides into his seat, and waves at the trio with a heavily bandaged hand. Harry calls out and asks him how the Scroots are, and Hagrid responds that they are thriving. Ron quietly comments that it looks like they finally found a food they like, Hagrid's fingers. He's interrupted by a girl from Bobatons, the same one who had laughed at Dumbledore's speech, asking if he's wanting the bouillabaisse. Ron looks up at the girl and goes purple at the sight of her large, deep blue eyes, very white, even teeth, and waist-length silvery blonde hair. He can't even manage to make a sound. So Harry pushes the dish towards her and says she can have it. I don't know. She doesn't sound like his type. She doesn't look anything like Victor Crumb. <laughs> Nothing like Victor <laughs> Crumb, honestly. <laughs> I thought he'd go for more the broad shoulder look. The what curved nose, heavy eyebrows. Yep. Everybody loves Surly that. expressions. Mm. Rawr. <laughs> Ron finally manages to breathlessly say it was excellent and goggles at her as she picks it up and heads back to the Ravenclaw table. Ron is returned to his senses when Harry laughs at him and he hoarsely exclaims that she must be a Vila. Hermione doesn't agree, saying no one else is gaping at her like an idiot, but she isn't entirely right because many other boys become temporarily speechless as they watch her walk across the hall. I mean, but that's also because they're fucking boys. Like, <laughs> they're adolescent males. I feel like they're going to goggle at all things. That Goggling is one thing, though. Becoming completely speechless. Like, Ron lost the ability to talk. He lost the ability to can. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How many guys do you think use that excuse, though? I couldn't help looking at her, honey. That was a Vila. But she must have been a Vila. <laughs> Only the shitty ones. Yeah. <laughs> Truth. This aspect is not included in the movie at all, though. Shocker, I know. What? Don't be too surprised. The blonde girl was given the spotlight and clearly emphasized to show her importance. But other than that, the boys and probably some of the girls started drooling over all the Bobaton girls. And the blonde wasn't given any kind of special head-turning powers. Speech endering powers. Yes. Speech endering. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just making up words now. That's what we do. It's kind yeah. of our thing. Ron insists that she's not a normal girl, saying they don't make them like that at Hogwarts. Without thinking, Harry says they make them okay at Hogwarts, as he notices Cho sitting a few seats away from the silvery-haired girl. Meanwhile, Hermione's just like, the fuck? Like, what am I, chopped liver? Apparently. Apparently. <laughs> Actually, what she does is change the subject. Probably the right call. Yes. She points out that Ludo Bagman and Mr. Crouch had arrived filling the two remaining empty seats at the staff table. Harry wonders what they're doing there, and Hermione supposes that they're present to see the start of the Triwizard Tournament, being the organizers and all. I mean, that makes kind of a bit of sense. Just a bit. Sure. I <laughs> I'll accept that. As will I. So we did see Mr. Crouch in the shoehorned movie scene, but as we've discussed before, no Ludo Bagman at all, which... Is still incredibly disappointing. Yeah, I haven't gotten over it yet. Mm hmm Probably won't. Sigh. <sighs> yeah, that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the second course of food arrives, and they notice a number of unfamiliar puddings as well. 
Ron carefully positions a blanc mange in full view of the blonde girl, but she appears to be full and doesn't come over. After everyone is finished eating, Dumbledore again stands to announce the start of the tournament and to give a few words of explanation. He introduces Bartimius Crouch, who gets some polite applause, and then Ludo Bagman, who gets a much louder, wild round of applause, probably cheers and... Woohoo! Bagman! 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 <laughs> Bagman smiles and waves while Crouch looks grouchy. He's crouchy. Crouchy. <laughs> <laughs> Oscar the Crouch. Oscar the Crouch. And Harry thinks he looks odd in wizard robes after last seeing him in an impeccable suit at the Quidditch World Cup. The movie still had him in that impeccable suit. So. Yeah, and I've said it before and I'm sure I'll say it again, but I've really missed the aspect of wizarding robes and them being unable to figure out how to dress like muggles. You have really brought me around to that mm -hmm. thinking. It never bothered me as much, but now that you're the one who's been like, why don't they do this? I'm like, oh. why don't they do this? Why don't they do that? <laughs> You're right. I love hearing you say that. <laughs> <laughs> but Dumbledore continues speaking about how tirelessly the two men have been working the past few months and says that they'll be joining him, Madame Maxime, and Professor Karkaroth on the panel of judges. So it's basically American Idol. Yes. But wizarding. Yes. <laughs> wizarding Wizard Idol. idol. <laughs> Dumbledore asks Filch to bring forward the casket. And Ron's like, the what? The casket, the Ron. What? The casket. And Filch approaches carrying a large wooden chest encrusted with jewels. You know, a casket. And as we already mentioned in the movie, the goblet was more in a fancy hat box type thing. Not a casket. Because that's weird. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> a casket is just a box. I mean, but it's weird. <laughs> just saying. It's a weird box. That's what it is. But otherwise, the main difference between this speech and the one in the movie is that Dumbledore basically passed the mic over to Mr. Crouch and had him give a portion of the directions. Yeah, in the book, Dumbledore just introduces them and keeps the spotlight. He explains that Mr. Crouch and Mr. Bagman have already gone over the instructions and made the necessary arrangements for the champions. There will be three tasks spaced throughout the school year designed to test the champions' magical prowess, daring, powers of deduction, and ability to cope with danger. If anyone has been paying attention to the last three years, they're pretty good at coping with danger. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just a bit. Just a bit. Smidgen. The hall becomes completely silent for a moment before Dumbledore continues on, saying that there will be one champion chosen from each school. They will be marked on how well they perform, and the champion with the highest total after the third task will win the Triwizard Cup. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. The champions will be chosen by an impartial selector, the Goblet of Fire. He takes out his wand and taps the casket three times. The lid slowly creaks open and Dumbledore reaches in to pull out a large wooden cup. And aside from the dancing blue flames, it's pretty unremarkable. Yeah. He closes the casket, places the cup on top of it, where everyone in the Great Hall can see it, and explains that anyone wishing to enter must write their name and their school nice and neatly on a piece of paper. I love that he specifies it has to be clearly. Well, yeah. Like, I'm not going to read your chicken scratch bullshit. <laughs> write that nicely. <laughs> it's a magical goblet, not a mind reader, you little fox. Right? <laughs> anyway, write it nice and neat. Drop it right in the goblet. Yep. The flames will not burn it up. It's magic. What? Holy shit, there's magic here? Movie Dumbledore doesn't tap his wand on the knock casket. He just points at it and it basically kind of melts away because that's way more normal. It's a little bit more magical. Yeah, a little I, bit. I mean, melting away versus opening on its own. Mm, I'll take the melty. He also like, it like melts away and reveals the goblet as opposed to him having to physically lift it out. Yeah. So, a little bit more magical in the movie. A little bit. A little bit more visually appealing for a movie, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. Another difference is that in the book, they only have 24 hours. It's like specifically stated. You got 24 hours to enter this because the three champions are going to be chosen tomorrow night at the Halloween feast. But the movie doesn't really specify how long. Yeah, Dumbledore said this hour Thursday night, which I mean, that could be the next night or it could be days after. We don't know. We have no idea when this is taking place. So in the book, he also reminds them of the age limit and tells them that he himself 
will be drawing an age line around the Goblet of Fire once it's been placed in the entrance hall to ensure that nobody under the age of 17 may enter their name. There was no mention of the age line in the movie up to this point, but it will get mentioned later, so we'll be talking about it then. Also in the movie, he didn't move it into the entrance hall. It just stayed in the Great Hall. Oh, yeah. Although it didn't look like the Great Hall. Like, it was clearly the Great Hall. It was like the emptied out Great Hall. Yeah. Like, (laughs) apparently they don't have three meals a day there. Yeah. It was odd. It was very weird. Anyway, yeah, it happens, but not in the same way. Shocker. And lastly, in the book, Dumbledore impresses upon them that the tournament is not to be entered lightly. It creates a binding magical contract, and there can be no change of heart. He then sends them off to bed and wishes them a good night. Which he does mention in that previous movie scene, though he doesn't send them off to bed, just tells them the tournament has officially begun before cutting to the next scene. Which does not correspond with this at all, as the chapter shows us the Gryffindors leaving the Great Hall. Yes. As they make their way out, they talk about what they just learned. Fred is sure that an age line will be fooled by an aging potion because Fred knows more than Dumbledore. Right. Though Hermione doesn't think anyone under the age of 17 would stand a chance. George tells her to speak for herself. (laughs) Like, I got this bitch. And asks Harry if he's going to try. Harry would probably stand a chance, too, for being honest. I I mean, well... Actually, if they could let Harry, Ron, and Hermione I would say if the together, trio could enter, sure. If they could do it as a team, they got that on lockdown. Hell yeah, they do. If you add their ages together, they're over 17, too. There's that. I feel like that should count for something. <laughs> I mean, maybe they should have just all dressed in a trench coat, <laughs> sat on each other's shoulders <laughs> yes. in a trench coat, and put their names in the Goblet of Fire. Nobody affair. would suspect a thing. Nothing ever. Harry, Ron, Hermione. Just one name. No, it's Haranmini. Haran. <laughs> Haranmini. <laughs> Haranmini. Haranmini. But Harry again imagines winning the Triwizard Tournament and then wonders how angry it would make Dumbledore if someone under 17 did get across the line. I don't think he'd be angry. He would just be like, you know what? Well done. <laughs> yeah, I don't think... So if someone can get past that age line... I mean, he wasn't really angry at Harry in the book, so we're going to get to that. Oh boy, are we going to get, to, get that? to that? That's some spoilers right now. Awkward. Ron is completely oblivious to everything being discussed right now because he's just looking for Victor Crumb and wondering where he's going to be sleeping. Victor, I love you. Exactly. <laughs> just as they're walking past the Slytherin table, Karkaroff shows up to take his students back to the ship. He asks Victor how he feels and if he ate enough, offering to send for some mulled wine from the kitchens. Mold wine is good shit, but I would I not give it to a 17-year-old. I don't know that I would want to drink it when I had a head cold either, but... True. I don't know. Remember when we had it at your Christmas party when I made so it? It was so good. So tasty. I don't even drink, but it was tasty. It was good. It smelled delicious, too. My kitchen smelled so good for a while. Mm-hmm. That's reason enough to make it. Yeah. Crumb shakes his head, because apparently he doesn't want the mold wine. Doesn't know what he's missing, I guess. Sure. But another Durmstrang boy hopefully asks for some. Karkaroff snaps at the boy and notices that he dribbled food all down his front again, calling him a disgusting boy. Like, what a dickhole. Like, that's just so shitty. I feel really bad for the boy. Like, give him some wine. Let him add it to the front of his shirt. Too. Right? Like, <laughs> what harm is it going to do at this on. point? Honestly. This is the moment where you're like, okay, so Karkaroff's an asshole. Mm-hmm. So we're not supposed to like him. Got it. Check. Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> going with the first impression there okay this this dude is the cover of his book i don't need any more than that (laughs) i just love that as a description thank you (laughs) (laughs) he turns to lead his students out of the great hall and reaches the doors at the exact same moment as the trio harry stops to let him through first and Karkaroff gives him a careless glance as he thinks him and then realizes who he is. And he just like freezes and stares awkwardly. Just, oh, Scar. <laughs> like deer in headlights, yeah. awkward stare. Which then gets his students all staring. And the boy with the food all down his front nudges a girl because there are girls at Durmstrang. No, it's an all-boys school. What are you talking about? He nudges the girl and points directly at Harry's forehead. Like, that has got to get old. Yeah. Or he just get used to it. Or you're just like, yeah. I feel like you'd have days where you'd be like, oh, my fucking God. Yes, (laughs) I'm Harry fucking Potter. Get the fuck out of my face. (laughs) Want to see the scar? You want to see the scar? (laughs) 
or he just like snaps and just draws lightning bolts all over his whole face. (laughs) Or anyone who notices his scar, he does like a charm on them to put a scar on their head. (laughs) Like not a permanent one, just temporary scar. Temporary scar, yeah. How do you like it? Luckily, he doesn't have to do that because he's got a growling voice from behind them confirming, yes, that's Harry Potter. (laughs) And Professor Karkaroff spins around to see Mad-Eye Moody just glaring at him, who also doesn't like the fact that he called that boy disgusting. That's what I'm going to go with. Yeah, sure. I'm sure there are other reasons than that, but Moody has already judged that cover right there. (laughs) (laughs) The color drains from Karkaroff's face. And he looks kind of scared and angry at the same time, which is an interesting reaction to seeing someone. Maybe a little bit aroused as well. I'm I'm not sure that was a thing. but (laughs) In my mind, it was. There's like so much sexual tension. I'm just telling you it wasn't Snape. (laughs) But Moody tells him that unless he has something to say to Potter, he might want to move since he's blocking the doorway. Oh, suck it. Get the fuck out of the way, bitch. Anyway. Move, bitch. Get, Get out, out the way. way. Get out, out the way, way, bitch. Get, Get out the way. way. Anyway. Sorry to everyone who just heard us. Karkaroff leaves with his students and Moody watches with a look of intense dislike on his face until he's completely out of sight. I mean, I feel like Karkaroff's got to be used to that, though, too, right? <laughs> if he acts the way he acts, probably. <laughs> the next day, Saturday morning, Halloween. And though most students would be sleeping in, Harry, Ron, and Hermione are not the only ones that got up much earlier than usual because everybody's excited about the goblet. Probably a good thing they did it on the weekend, huh? Yeah. (laughs) They head down to the entrance hall and find about 20 students milling around, just hanging out, seeing what's going on. What's the happy haps who's putting their name in? Again, as we mentioned, it's in the entrance hall, not in the great hall. Yes. So everyone's just kind of hanging out there. It's setting on a stool. It's the stool that would normally hold the sorting hat at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. And there's a thin golden line drawn around it, forming a 10 foot in diameter circle. This is where the movie scene actually starts up and begins corresponding to the chapter. What? I know. It's crazy. (laughs) Students are entering their names into the Goblet of Fire as other students watch and clap because... Obviously, anyone who would enter the tournament has an undeniable thirst for attention. Obviously. Obviously. So we know all the Gryffindors put their names in. All of the 17 and up Gryffindors. And even some that weren't, as we know. (laughs) As we are about to learn. As we're about to find out. There are students watching in the book, and Ron asks the third year if anyone has put their name in yet. And she responds that everyone from Durmstrang has, but she hasn't seen anyone from Hogwarts yet. Harry thinks that some of them must have put their names in after everyone had gone to bed because that's how he would have done it. Because he wouldn't have wanted anyone watching. And he says that out loud. I because that. that's actually significant. Mm-hmm. As we will learn later. Mm-hmm. In the movie, they watch as a couple of Hufflepuff dude bros steer Cedric Diggory forward, encouraging him to put it in with absolutely <laughs> no concept of just how dirty that sounds because... You know, Hufflepuff. They're so cute. He briefly looks back at them and hesitates. But at this point, it's a little late to back out. So he follows through and chucks his name in the hat. Or cup. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) Ron glances at Harry and they join in the applause. As Cedric smiles and turns away from the goblet, Ron tries to wave at him, but is shot down and awkwardly lowers his hand. Which is what we were talking about when we mentioned that the movies completely omitted the disdain that the Gryffindors, particularly Ron, show towards Cedric in the book. Yeah, like he kind of gives Harry a little bit of a side eye, but you don't really get it. You don't quite understand that there's kind of almost an animosity there. Yeah. So Cedric and his bros embrace, like bros do. Brothers got a hug. Right? (laughs) Right. And Ron forgets who he's talking to and ruminates over the joys of possible eternal glory. Harry says he's good because, you know, Harry Potter. (laughs) Basically, the ship has already sailed. We're good. Which echoes the sentiment of Harry saying he wouldn't have put his name in while people were watching. But it's also basically completely the opposite. (laughs) Yeah. Because he's essentially saying he wouldn't do it at all. Right. In the movie, he's just like, better you than me. And... In the book, he's just, like, imagining himself winning it. Yeah. So. 
Which, I mean, who knows what movie Harry was thinking. He could have been thinking that, too, and just saying out loud that he wouldn't. True. But at the same time, he didn't play it that way. He did not. It was not played that way at all. He played it as if he didn't want anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. Which was fine. Yeah. I don't think book Harry ultimately really wanted anything to do with it either. I think it was all about doing something to get Cho's attention. Yeah. Because every single time he imagined it, Cho was like right there being all admiring of him. I think it had much more to do with Cho than actually competing or winning, Yeah, even. Fred and George then enter the Great Hall with all the decorum of attention-starved toddlers. Yep. (laughs) Instead of keeping their heads down and just trying to sneak their names into the goblet, in true Fred and George fashion, they make a spectacle of themselves, inviting everyone to watch their brilliant plan unfold. This is actually pretty similar to the book. Mm Mm-hmm. Because Harry, Ron, and Hermione hear a laugh behind them and turn to see Fred and George with Lee Jordan, who's completely left out of the movie scene. He's completely left out of the movie, actually. I think that was a poor choice. Definitely a poor choice. Mm -hmm. Anyway, those three, because Lee Jordan was in the book, are hurrying down the staircase looking extremely excited. Fred tells them that they just took the aging potion and Lee says that they're going to split the thousand galleons between them if one of them wins. Hermione tries to warn them that she isn't sure it'll work because Dumbledore would have thought of this, but they just ignore her. In the movie, Hermione also warns them that it's not going to work while her eyebrows attempt to help direct oncoming traffic and the twins question her assessment. And her eyebrows are so goddamn insane in this movie. I would blame her whole forehead. Right? I mean, it's certainly sure as hell not helping. <laughs> Holy shit, they're like crazy. Anyway. I mean, I can't believe you'd insult her eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> she explains that Dumbledore drew the age line around the goblet himself, and there's no way two 16-year-old troublemakers are going to come in and trick it with some stupid shit. Because <laughs> for some reason, she keeps making that noise during this scene. She really does. Maybe she has a hairball. Maybe. <laughs> this is also the first time the movie mentions the age line. Even though the book actually had Dumbledore tell the students he was going to draw it. He was like, I'm doing this myself, (laughs) so I know you can't dupe it. Right. And Fred and George are like, we're going to dupe it. (laughs) Do they dupe it? They don't dupe it. They don't dupe it. They don't dupe it. it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the twins point out that since Dumbledore is so smart, he would never expect anyone to try something so stupid. Obviously forgetting that Dumbledore runs a wizarding school and is fluent in the language of stupid adolescent hijinks. They stand up, shake the vials holding the potion as though they are getting ready to shotgun a can of beer, link arms like a newlywed couple, and down the potion in one go. In the movie, they'd already taken the potion before they showed up in the entrance hall. Fred decides he'll go first and pulls a slip bearing the words Fred Weasley Hogwarts out of his pocket and is apparently neatly. I mean... So it's readable. Yeah. Well, he said it had... Dumbledore said it had to be. It had to be. So there's that. At least they listen to something. With everyone watching him, he steps over the line, and for a split second, it looks like it worked. And George certainly thinks so, and he gives a yell of triumph and crosses the line too. And then there's a loud popping sound, and the twins are just hurled out of the circle. In the movie, they jump into the circle at the same time and prematurely enjoy a round of applause as their plan seems to have worked. They both toss their names in the goblet and another round of applause can be heard as they seem to have outsmarted over a century of magical study and training. What? What? It's crazy. It worked? Ah! We knew it would the whole time. Oh, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Celebration time. Yes, they high five and almost on cue, the goblet catches onto their bullshit and goes ape. (laughs) flames whip out in all directions and the twins get flung across the great hall at a speed that should probably have broken a bone or two if we're being honest they have plot armor it's okay (laughs) kind of love that plot armor stronger than steel everyone steps back startled as the twins hit the floor not at all expecting things to escalate so quickly in the book they land about 10 feet away on the stone floor so kind of similar sure And they sprout identical long white beards. (laughs) Everyone starts laughing, including Fred and George, when they see each other. Because it's like looking in a mirror. Yeah. And an amused voice tells them that he did warn them. Mm Mm-hmm. They turn to see Dumbledore exiting the Great Hall, blue eyes twinkling. He tells them to go see Madame Pomfrey to sort out their fine beards. 
And they set off, accompanied by Lee Jordan, who was howling with laughter. I want to believe that literally Dumbledore just hung out in that area the entire day just to see someone try and fuck with the goblet and get turned into an old person. Not someone, all of the someone. Yes, all of the someones. But I love how he mentioned that some other students had aged themselves up a bit and yeah. neither of their beards were as fine as Fred and George. <laughs> Do you think he told that to all of the bearded students yeah. or just Fred and George's beards were really that fine? Right. They're pretty fine beards, gotta say. Aside from getting flung across the hall and growing beards, the movie scene is quite different, though. They sit up and see that they now look old as fuck and begin fighting with each other over who fucked up more and who looks more like Donald Sutherland. Because it's what they fucking look like. Yeah, so. and they definitely, I wonder if it was just the beards or if maybe their bones brittled too and now they're about to break a hip. Maybe. Ooh, you know what? That might be it. In the end, they get the laughs they're usually after, though maybe not in the way that they had hoped. But in exactly the way that they deserved. <laughs> right. But they definitely did not fight each other in the book. No. They thought it was hilarious. It was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> They're Fred and George. They know when something's hilarious. Yeah. And that shit is hilarious. That shit's fucking funny. <laughs> Plus, the movie didn't have Dumbledore giving his I told you so, which that pissed me off because I would have liked to see that. I love the idea of Dumbledore just watching. That's amazing. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. Right. In the book, while still chortling, Harry, Ron, and Hermione head into the Great Hall for breakfast and join Dean and Seamus, who are talking about the Hogwarts students that might be entering. Dean says there's a rumor that the big bloke from Slytherin who looks like a sloth, Warrington, got up early to put his name in. Hope he doesn't move like a sloth. He'd be a terrible champion. I mean, maybe he does, and that's why he didn't get picked. Maybe. Harry shakes his head in disgust, saying they can't have a Slytherin champion. You know what? Fuck Harry and his house pride. That's a shitty thing to say. Rude. 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 I don't take shit personally or anything. Not at all. <laughs> the movie actually has a bit more to this scene than was included in the book, because, you know, why not change things and add other random details and take out stuff we really wanted to see at the same time? Victor Crumb walks into the room and everyone watches as he puts his name in the goblet. A resounding collective groan echoes through the room as all the Durmstrang hopefuls now know with all certainty that they will not be chosen. I feel like they knew before they even put their names in. They only went along to get out of normal school. I mean, that's probably why they agreed to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would. Even if I didn't think I was going to get chosen, but let's face it, I'm a Gryffindor and I'm extra. I'm going to get chosen. Oh my God. <laughs> You're so... <laughs> extra? Wow. <laughs> Something. There is a confidence about you that if I could bottle it, I would just make millions. That'd be kind of cool, actually. Wouldn't it? I could sell it as like... Felix Felicius? Prozac. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, they show the Durham Strange students coming in to put their names in, and, and they mentioned in the books that they had already done that. Crumb pauses for a moment to look intensely at Hermione, who semi-smiles back, but really looks more confused than anything. Elsewhere in the world, Kenny G wakes up in a cold sweat and begins composing the most awkward love ballad known to man. And that's where this part of the movie section ends. We are also going to end the book chapter at this point, since this is a long chapter. So now, for this week's Potter Pondering. Which is, would you join SPEW? Aw, but if you said, would you join SPEW, that rhymes. Would you join SPEW? Would you Join SPEW, or <laughs> if you're like Hermione, S-P-E-W. <laughs> Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. We really look forward to reading them. Our Sorting Hat story this week is from Jessica McFarland. She writes, I am a Ravenclaw. My wand is Larchwood with a unicorn hair core, 10 inches. And my Patronus is a Manx cat. Same as mine. <laughs> oh, I like you already. I got into Harry Potter because my neighbor lent me the first book. I was resisting it at first, but once I started, I was hooked by the last paragraph of the first chapter of the first book. 20 plus years later, I'm still just as hooked. I like to write little short stories to fill in parts of the story, such as the conversation between Harry and Ginny about naming their second child. Oh my god. Right? I would love to read some of those stories. So would I. It's pretty funny to think about how those conversations could have gone. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing your Sorting Hat story with us, Jessica. Yeah, thank you. 
And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your sorting hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else that you might want to share with us. You can also just message us on social media. And that will bring us to this week's trivia question. How many scroots does Hagrid have left after he had to put them into separate boxes because they started killing each other? The prize for the first one who responds with the correct answer and the code word hashtag that's lucky will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes. If you don't have an Apple account, you can write a recommendation on our Facebook page. Then email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. If you would like to support us as a patron for extra perks, you can go to patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. In addition to getting you some extra perks, like Just Keep Rolling swag, patron-only Facebook groups, virtual meetups, bonus content, and more, your patronage also helps us to continue producing this podcast our cooking show, and bringing more content your way. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, monthly blooper reels, vlogs, and other random videos. And join us next week when we talk about the second half of Chapter 16, The Goblet of Fire, and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just keep rolling. rolling.